It's the end of an era, barring any unforeseen changes in plan by 2024 or the end of that year anyway, the International Space Station, which has been the symbol of East-West cooperation for two decades, will finally come to an end, at least as we recognize it right now. The Russians intend to abandon the station, and to be quite honest, I think it highly unlikely that they're going to leave the extremely valuable modules of their side of the station behind. But it goes far deeper than that. For many years during the time of the first Cold War, and yes, I'm now calling this Cold War Part 2 because that's what it pretty much amounts to, the space agencies of both respective superpowers still collaborated as much as they possibly could. The Apollo-Soyuz mission, for example, was an amazing demonstration of how two agencies could collaborate on a very complicated mission in spite of all the political hostility that existed between the two superpowers. And the ISS was just the next step in that process. Following up, of course, from the times that the shuttle rendezvoused with the Mir space station starting in 1995. This was a very optimistic time in the history of our two countries. So many collaborative missions between 1995 and the present day. Russian cosmonauts and U.S. astronauts together with ESA astronauts and others relying on one another for their very survival in in the hostile environment of deep space. Indeed, the collaboration went much deeper than that. As we all know, the Atlas V and various other versions of Atlas made use of Russian engines. Also, the Antares rocket makes use of Russian components as well. There was so much collaboration between our two space agencies, and now all of that is coming to an end. But here's the question. Can the ISS survive without the Russians? And what are the Russians likely to do with their half of the station if they take off with it? By now, all of us have seen this funny joke about abandoning an American astronaut on the European slash American slash Japanese side of the station and taking off with only the Russian modules, leaving the poor guy to his fate. And even though this was a joke in very bad taste, the reality behind it is a little disturbing. The fact of the matter is, the Russian side of the station could function as its own independent space station, whereas the rest of the ISS cannot. Let me explain why this is the case and why we need to take this threat very seriously as 2024 approaches. Currently, this is what the Russians say their new space station is going to look like. It's very generic, very ordinary looking modules, similar to the types of modules that are already on the ISS. They say they're going to spend maybe about 4 billion US dollars on it, and I say that that's a load of sh because the Russian space agency is beyond cash-strapped right now. There is absolutely no reason to build a new station when you have a perfectly functional station that can be detached from the existing ISS. These are the Russian components of the ISS, comprised of the Zarya module, the Zvezda, the Poisk, the Rasvets, the Noika, and the Prikal. 
Now the pre-call located right here is a nodular module that was supposed to be attached to a brand new space station which was called the Orbital Piloted Assembly and Experiment Complex. But of course this space station was discontinued because of funding problems and that was back in 2017. Given the current state of Roscosmos, I don't see how the hell they could possibly restart their building process on a new space Space station. It just doesn't seem practical, especially given the fact that the original modules can still function. The most important thing about the Russian segments of the ISS is the fact that they can maneuver on their own. The thrusters used to keep the space station in orbit and also to perform what are called damage avoidance maneuvers or dams are located on the Zvezda service module which is right here and it contains what's called the integrated propulsion system which consists of two orbital correction engines plus 32 small thrusters designed to control course yaw and bank maneuvers on the module and these are fed by four tanks two tanks for the oxidizer and two tanks for fuel a very wise precaution in case you don't have a spacecraft docked with the station that's capable of orbiting orbital reboost and as I said it's on the Russian side of the station and it will be much easier to use these thrusters if it doesn't have to push nearly as much weight and it won't if it ditches the vast majority of the ISS. When you consider the size of some of the rest of the Russian modules, you can actually see that the Russians are going to have a fairly substantial space station under their control if they do separate this thing from the ISS. The Zarya module, for example, which was the first module of the ISS, is 41.2 feet in length and 13.5 feet in diameter, a pretty sizable module on its own and was originally originally built for the Mir space station, and that's only just the beginning. The Russians also have the Poisk module, which is also known as the Mini Research Module 2, that provides a port for the docking of Soyuz spacecraft, and it also provides a place to prepare for EVAs and the refurbishing of the Russian Orlan spacesuits, and it has the extra bonus of additional space for scientific experiments as well as power supply outlets. It's also equipped with both internal and external workstations to accommodate science payloads and make observations. It's almost identical to the Pierce docking compartment in terms of its size, 16 feet long, 8.4 feet in diameter. And then you have the Rosvet module, which is primarily used for cargo storage and some payload operations, and ironically it was delivered by the space shuttle Atlantis on the STS-132 mission. It's 19.7 feet in length and 7.7 .7 feet in diameter, and by the way, weighs nearly 6 tons. All of these are very substantial modules and will combine to make quite a space station should the Russians choose to use it for that purpose. And then finally you have the most infamous portion of the Russian side of the station and that is the Noika with all of the problems that it had during its initial teething pains but now it seems to be fully functional. This is now the primary laboratory of the Russian orbital segment and it works in conjunction with the mini research modules Rosvet and Poisk. It's used to conduct experiments obviously to store scientific instruments and can also serve as a backup service module to the ISS. It's based on what's called the functional cargo block design. It's very big, 43 feet long, almost 14 feet wide, and it has a mass of well over 20 tons. This thing really pushed the capabilities of the Proton-M to deliver it to the space station in the first place, but the Noika has already been considered as the core module for a new space station to succeed the ISS, at least as far as the Russians are concerned. This thing has its own life support equipment 
equipment, including an oxygen production system capable of supporting six crew members, along with a galley, a toilet, a urine recycling system, and one of three sleep stations aboard the Russian orbital segment. It has its own observational window, obviously not nearly as good as the cupola that exists on the European slash US side of the station, but it unquestionably has the capability to serve as the research headquarters of a new space station for the Russian Federation. Now, don't get me wrong, none of this is going to be nearly as ambitious as what currently exists on the ISS. The Russians will be able to accomplish far less with an independent space station than what they could have been able to accomplish in conjunction with NASA, the ESA, the Japanese Space Agency, and others. But since they've decided to go it alone, in my opinion, this is the way they're going to go it alone. Yes, some of these modules are ancient. They have serious technical problems that are probably going to have to be worked on extensively in order to make this station viable. But here's the deal. The station has its own independent life support system. It has enough space for several crew members. And most importantly, it has its own propulsion system for debris avoidance maneuvers. Everything that a space station requires to be functional will be viable on the Russian side of the station. They're not going to need to take anything from the Americans, from the Japanese, or the Europeans in order to be able to go it alone. Whereas on the other side of the station, things are going to be a lot more serious. The other side of the station does not have any sort of independent ability to avoid debris. And also, the majority of debris avoidance maneuvers that have been carried out up to this point have been carried out by Progress resupply ships from, guess who, the Russians. As a result, you're going to need a spacecraft capable of ISS reboost, constantly attached to what remains of the ISS in order to make it safe. And there are precious few of those vehicles left. We have a couple launches of the Cygnus that remain, and on top of that, we have the Dream Chaser, which is yet to enter service, but it's capable of ISS reboost, as is the Starliner and all the problems associated with that. This puts the Americans, the Europeans, and everybody else in a bit of a lurch after 2024. And without question, all of these agencies are going to have to work very hard to get viable solutions in place prior to the end of 2024. We're only talking about a couple of years here, and that's assuming that the Russians don't decide to accelerate their timetable. However, it does bear mentioning that there is no official notification from Roscosmos to NASA saying that they are officially going to end their collaboration at the end of 2024. This may just be a bit of Russian propaganda to make Putin happy, but I really doubt it. Given the fact that the Russians can definitely make a go of it on their own with the modules that they have from the ISS, they have no reason to continue their collaboration collaborative efforts if they don't want to. And it's obvious that the people who are in positions of power in Russia, or at least those who want to keep Putin happy, are not interested in further collaboration. This is a serious tragedy for the future of spaceflight. For any of those who say that we can easily make do without the Russians, that's just a bunch of nationalistic claptrap. The Russians have a tremendous amount of experience in orbit, far more than just about anybody else's astronauts. They've set all kinds of endurance records in space that our astronauts can scarcely approach on top of many other accomplishments, especially when it comes to space stations. They've been setting endurance records in space with the Salyut stations and the Mir far
far before the ISS even existed. And here's another complication. The ISS was supposed to be a platform for future commercial space stations, namely the one being constructed by Axiom. What's going to happen to that now, given the fact that the ISS is not nearly going to be as viable or as safe as it used to be? How are we going to be able to complete that station with the Russians having removed a good chunk of the station that it's supposed to be built on? That's going to be extremely complicated. On top of that, the Axiom modules were supposed to be using the ISS's life support systems in order to support its modules until they were ready to be free flying. That obviously is not going to be happening either. However, this might also be an opportunity for Axiom to save the ISS. If they are adding these new modules anyway, they might also be able to add propulsion systems to these modules in order to provide a new debris avoidance maneuver system for the rest of the ISS. Obviously, they would need to do this very quickly, but given the fact that the first module of the Axiom station is due to be installed in less than two years, that might actually be perfect timing. It's also worth considering that the Axiom station will have just about the same amount of pressurized space as what's left of the ISS anyway. It's also going to have an equivalent amount of power, even though the solar array, as you can see, is much smaller. It's using far more advanced solar technology, which means this station could very easily replace the ISS if the assembly process was accelerated. It might be a NASA interest to take some of the money that they had reserved to continue ISS operations and plug it into Axiom in order to provide a viable replacement in time before the Russians split the station apart. But whatever way you look at this, and whatever solutions might exist for this problem, this is a tragedy for human spaceflight. The ISS was a symbol of East-West collaboration for over two decades. This was a symbol of what mankind was capable of accomplishing when we're not trying to kill each other. And now it's come to a conclusion and the Earth is being plunged into a brand new Cold War. Every bit as dangerous, if not more dangerous, than the one we left in the early 90s. It is a grim future to face without question and one that I don't see a way out of unless Russia has a change in leadership. Smash that like, hit that subscribe, please check the description for various ways to support this content in the future, and as always, stay angry about space!